Welcome to Convoy Radio. This is the podcast reporting on the ever-changing freight industry. My name is Jake Henderson. And I am Michael Lewis, and we are going to be bringing you ideas and leading voices from this fast-changing world of transportation and logistics. Now, Mike, our show is going to bring together the people that you want to hear from and get their take on the future of our business. Tune in for an inside look at today's opportunities and tomorrow's revolutions in the trucking industry. (coughs) Wow. Michael. Wow. Here we are once again. How are you today, my friend? I'm doing pretty dang good, Jake. How are you? I'm doing excellent. Just or, back. On, what was that nickname you just told me about? They used to call me Sendy Hendy back in the day because I used to go full send on absolutely everything. Was that because we were just talking about you and your trip to Vegas Ooh. and you're from Vegas. Is Sendy Hendy around Vegas activities? I'm going to clarify like this. the gambling there or what's the Sendy Hendy from? I'm going to clarify this. I'm not from Vegas. I'm from a small town outside of Chicago originally. Lived in Vegas for a few years, a few different times. Sandy Hendy is in regards to, I like to gamble a lot, responsibly, of course, but I do like to gamble a little bit. So when I go to Vegas, it's just full send around the clock. Yeah. Roulette, blackjack, Marlboro exactly. lights, you name it. I mean, you look at your, your sleeves you got going, not mm-hmm. the sleeves for any nice sweatshirt that you'd wear on a normal day, but the sleeves that you have tattooed onto you. Yeah. And you can definitely feel that Vegas vibe coming off of it. Is that just because you feel that like as that is your hometown and you're loyal to it or? Vegas is where I became a man. I'm going to put it like that. Okay. Vegas is where I learned that life isn't always fair. Okay. They're not liking this. We're supposed to be talking about news. But I know, but this is interesting. This is interesting. You, know what, we, you know what we didn't say? What? It's Convoy Radio, another episode. Oh my goodness. I don't goodness. even think we said what we're... All right. Should we try this again? No. All right, and we're live, Convoy Radio episode. Who really knows? We're just having a good time out here. We have a fantastic news article today that we're going to be discussing in greater detail with our guests. Is that correct, Michael? That is correct. We got Sammy Makes Sense, the YouTube personality, coming on with us in five minutes or so. But we're going to dive in and see who's really hauling spot, not British, spot market spot freight, freight, spot freight, <laughs> top of the morning. We're, we got a bad accent, but who's hauling the spot market freight? And I feel like when I first joined a brokerage, you learn that large fleets and these larger carriers get most of their freight directly from shippers. You might think about the really big guys like Swift, like uh, Knight and Warner, and those are the huge ones. But when you look at like the number of carriers that there are in the market, there's tens of thousands. And so there's all these guys in between 20 trucks, 30 trucks, 200 trucks, 400 trucks. But like the perception is that these guys are primarily hauling directly to shippers. And this article is breaking down kind of the spectrum of these carriers in terms of number of trucks and saying, how likely are these carriers to haul the majority of the freight directly with shippers as opposed to being on the spot market? And the numbers are pretty surprising. Like they're looking at trucks in this study between five trucks in the fleet, all the way up to 200 trucks. And the largest group that hauls directly with shippers is five to seven which for me was really surprising because I think that is a small fleet of like maybe a group of owner operators who are grouping together to run the spot market. But it's saying that these are really small carriers that are centered and located around local shippers that just don't need the type of volume move that a Warner or a Knight would ship. Yeah. And it's not that they're just hauling more spot freight or excuse me, more contracted freight. It's that like Fleets ranging five to seven trucks, 85% of their business is made up direct from shipper, mm-hmm. which to me is like outrageous. Like I never would have assumed that five to seven truck fleets were, were going directly to the source. But like you said, they're filtering into like those local mom and pop shippers and they're just running reloads constantly on that, which this article kind of starts off talking about like how to start a freight brokerage. And typically what people are told according to this article is make as many uh, relationships with owner operators as possible. Mm -hmm. And what this data says is no, that's not the best way to go about and do it because the the trucks or the fleets that you do want to build a relationship with are the ones that range from 41 to 65 trucks. And then also the 66 to 100, like those are by far the two groups of carriers that are most likely to haul below 70% of their freight contracted. Yeah. And for that amount of trucks in a fleet, that's a significant portion. Even if it was at the line 70%, still 30% of those trucks hauling spot market freight 
is very significant because I don't know, you have an average, I'm going to do really poor math here, but like, take your best shot. Yeah. Like 70 trucks in one of those fleets. That's ah, shoot. 70 is a really bad number to choose, but that's like more than 15 to 20 trucks per day hauling spot market freight. Yeah. I think the the, the bottom line here is just this kind of, this really did blow me away Yeah, because at my old brokerage, all we would talk about is our relationship with owner operators, our relationship with owner operators, our ability to, to, to get owner operators on your loads. And like, yeah, that's great. Owner operators are great, but according to the data, they're not the ones that really run the majority of the spot market. Spot market volume. I think that's correct. As a number of businesses that Mm -hmm. are focused on the spot market, number of like, actual businesses, owner operators, and fleets four and below in size are going to be hauling primarily spot market freight. And it's going to be the majority of their freight. But perhaps if you're looking at total number of loads moved, because each one of these carriers who has 41 to 65 trucks is going to have 20 trucks moving spot freight. You know what else? 30 is, trucks moving spot You know what freight. else is interesting with this article mm-hmm. too? This article took on two things, right? Who's moving your spot freight? And then they tackled the question, how many trucks are actually out in the marketplace? The number that I've heard regularly over the past two years is 3 million trucks. What this article goes on to say is that's not actually the case. Oh. A lot of that is bad data based on trucking companies that gone out of business and deactivated MC numbers, what they're really projecting is interstate travel. We're looking at 1.57 million trucks, right? So almost half of what I've been accounting for over the past two years. That's a significant decrease in the amount of trucks that are actually out in the marketplace. And that's interstate? That's interstate, yeah. Okay. We know intrastate, you want to know, oh, interstate, I didn't ping that graph, but off the top of my head, it was like 197,000. Okay. Trucks. I mean, most of them probably California, Texas. Yeah, for for Pennsylvania, intrastate. Yeah, but interstate. The fact that they're accounting for half of the trucks that I assumed were always in the marketplace is pretty remarkable. And they go on to say, Freight Waves is really good about being honest and saying, like, hey, this is just the data that we've pulled. And I think they they write some really objective and like gritty articles, which I appreciate because a lot of the articles that you see in the industry are fluff pieces and they're kind of pandering to both sides. Mm-hmm. Freight Waves has a way of just telling it like it is. So I'm giving you the data. Yeah. So I, I really do like freight waves. This isn't a plug for them. You know what I think is interesting. You guys can pay me if you want. I'm, I'll go on retainer <laughs> for you guys, but I really do like your articles. You know, what I think it's interesting is I would love to talk with a couple of these fleets who are primarily spot market carriers who are between 60 and a hundred trucks and just see what the operation of that is like, because obviously contracted freight, you have that consistency. You're not needing, or you're not needing to go out every day and make sure your trucks are covered or up to five days out. Um, I'd love to see like the complexities that they face and how they run an efficient operation. Because if you have that many trucks, even if it's just half of them running spot market freight, are you giving those drivers the ability to go out and find their own freight? I'd be really curious to see how you can run that large of an operation and do it efficiently working the spot market. Yeah, typically it's dispatchers. Dispatchers just eating up Mm -hmm. all that spot freight. And I I can't get you... A uh, uh, 41 to 60 truck fleet today. But what I can get you is our guest, Sammy Lloyd, owner operator, mm-hmm. over the road trucker extraordinaire. And what we're going to talk about is his strategy in the spot market, how he views the spot market, some tips and tricks for all the other drivers out there. Love so it. without should further we, ado, should we, should we take a quick break and then come back? Let's take a Sammy? quick break. We need to finish our Vegas conversation. I've got some stories that I do want to tell you that we Love have that. to go off air for. I understand. But let's get this thing. Yeah. All right. And we are back. Michael Lewis, it's been about five minutes since our last conversation. Everything good with you during that break? No, I'm still sitting here, still looking at you. So, Oh my goodness gracious. Let's get into this whole thing. Uh, As I mentioned during our news article, we have Sammy Lloyd, YouTube sensation with us. Sammy, how are you, man? Hey man, I'm great. How are you guys? We are doing well. And you were telling me just before we started here, that you are driving through Nevada right now is 110 degrees out. I just got back from Nevada myself. Do you know exactly where you are? Is it like Reno, Sparks, outside of Las Vegas? No, nah, I'm north of Vegas. I'm at some little parking area for trucks. I had to whip in here and get a get me a 30 minute break in and grab a snack. So I don't know exactly where I'm at. I'm just north of Vegas. That's all I know. Okay, I'm glad you're not driving as we're doing this interview. That makes me feel a little bit better and less concerned. <laughs> and I don't think that would go. I mean, I've seen the vlogs. The vlogs are just cruising around, making good videos out there with Sammy. So 
I wouldn't say professional. Professional. He's a professional. Not like me. Sammy, so we know about you, but a lot of our listeners don't, especially if they're not kind of in tune with the YouTube world of trucking. So would you do me a favor and just give me a little background on yourself? I know you started in the industry back in, I want to say 2013. Is that accurate? No, I actually started driving in 2000. In 2000. Okay. Where did I get 2013? Yeah. All right. Anyway, that's when I became an owner operator. That's what it was. That's what it was. Okay. So the year's 2000. Uh, how did you even get into the industry to start? I landed a job as a delivery helper with a, uh, a Budweiser distributor in my area. I don't know it. Two or three months there, somebody said, Hey, why don't you get your CDL and uh, get your own route? You can make a lot more money on the year. And I said, Okay, what I do for that? They said, Well, go talk to. I think his name was Leon. They said, go talk to Leon. He'll tell you what to do. And he basically said, go get your uh, learner's permit. We'll do on-the-job training. And when you get comfortable, we'll take you down to the technical college and let you test out. So that's what I've done. A few more months after that, after I got my CDL, I decided to go OTR. Done that for about six months. Came back home, found a local job until 2013 and decided to buy a truck and uh, come back out here and do it all over again, but as an owner-operator. What was the first truck that you bought? It was a 2010 Cascadia Freightliner. You thought, and did you know anything about like, hey, this is the kind of truck that I want? Or did you just like find an ad for it and you're like, well, damn, I need a truck. This is it right here. <laughs> well, I always knew I wanted a hood truck, but being new, I didn't have the, the credit needed. I mean, buying a truck, I've learned it's harder to, to buy a big truck than it is to buy a house. So, really? This is going to make me sound ignorant. How much does a brand new truck off the lot costs. Like we're talking a 2019 Cascadia. Now that, I don't know. I'm going to assume around 140. Oof. Oof. The only trucks that I price nowadays is uh 170 to 200. So I don't know about the freight liners. Okay. All right. So you, so you bought your own truck and what, you just started driving for yourself? Well, actually uh, me and my brother, we, we got the Cascadia and we leased on with a company and drove team. Within about six months, we realized we couldn't make enough money in a team truck uh, as owner ops to basically feed both households. So I left him the truck. I got out of that truck and bought another truck. And that was a uh, 2011 Kenworth T660. I'm trying to like picture these trucks in my head. Sammy, I just, uh, I just don't. a quick question. When you're driving over the road in a team, is it like generally one of you guys is sleeping while the other one's up? So it's still like you'd be driving solo or are you guys like joking around most of the time? What, what's it like to be in a, cab for that amount of time with one of your siblings with my brother it was was no big deal we've always we grew up best friends so it was no big deal with my brother now i couldn't say what it'd be like with somebody else uh i imagine somebody get on your nerves but yeah ideally if you uh if you're teaming properly while one sleeps the other is uh driving for the mo most part michael do you think that you could drive with your brother which one dan dan probably really you think you guys would get along i think i think most of my brothers we just talk for the most part. And with each brother, we talk about different subjects, but we just kind of conversate or sleep. So I think it wouldn't be too big a deal. Sammy, one of the things that I'm trying to comprehend, and you might find this interesting, is like, we talk about that, like, oh yeah, like we would talk, but you're on the road. I mean, all the time, you are constantly driving. Like eventually you run out of things to talk about, right? No, never. No, never. <laughs> Yeah, I guess that's the key no, to having never. a driving partner, right? Finding somebody that will always keep yeah. you. Okay. Just commenting on all the four wheels driving around you and, and the, all the different Well, people. that's what I was about to say. There's always a car that's going to cut you off, so that gives you something to talk about. Yeah, there's, they, also, there's always a different sunset and a sunrise and a different mountain and different accents and different people from state to state to state. I mean, it's, light it's, talk. it's always What's different. What's going on live? Yeah, there's always something to talk about. So where, where are you from, Sammy? I'm from North Georgia. You're from North Georgia. So you start driving over the road and was it kind of like you started regional at first or you said, no, let's dive full in. Let's just start hauling loads all the way up to Seattle and Northern California and just North of Nevada, uh, Las Vegas. What was that kind of transition like? Uh, I went full OTR, lower 48. Got it. it so didn't matter. Just dove full straight in. Yeah. The moment we've all been waiting for, we're going to talk about the spot market. I know you've put out some videos recently on the spot market. What's your opinion? Are we sitting in a soft spot market right now? Is there money to be made out there? What's, what's your opinion with what's going on in, on the spot side of business? Uh, the spot is a, that's a tricky subject there. 
I will say this. I stepped out with my own authority in 2017. Mm -hmm. In my first year as a uh, carrier, I thought I'd done pretty well. And I was doing pretty decent at rates. And then 2018 happened and everything mm -hmm. exploded. My opinion is this. I'm still doing in this market today better than I was in 2017. Is it 2018? <laughs> Not even close. But I'm still better than it was when I first started as a carrier. So I think the market's kind of settled back down. And my opinion, yes. Well, it's not my opinion. I'm I'm making money in this market. So yeah, you okay, can make so it. Obviously, 2018 was a crazy hot year. And you didn't have to be as selective with loads that you were taking. You could hold out longer and negotiate easier because freight had to move. What What's kind of your strategy in a normal market to make money without trying to hold out too long and just wait around for those big money loads? Uh, well, I got two angles here and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use two different scenarios. I'm going to use playing pool as one and playing poker as the other. <laughs> the playing got, pool. Got when you're playing pool. Uh, <laughs> handy, handy. <laughs> I, I, heard you. The pool. I like the poker one, so I'm excited for this. Yeah, I had to use the poker. I told you love, you're, you love the poker scene and uh, so we're going to go with both of them. But Playing pool. It's like when you play pool, you're always setting up your next shot. Same way with the with the trucking industry and, and spot market. You're always thinking a load ahead. When I'm booking load A, I'm always thinking about load B. Mm. So a lot of people make the mistake. They go into a, they say a load with put a lot of money on it, such as Denver. Denver's got a lot of freight going in that pays damn well. But once you get to Denver, you're taking a chance of sitting, waiting on the load to come out. And if I'm looking at the load board and I see a load going to Denver that's paying $3 a mile, or I see a load that's going down to Dallas and Dallas is a hot market at $2 a mile, I'm going to take the Dallas load. It's less money going down. It can even be the same, same mileage. I'm going to choose Dallas every day because when I get to Dallas, I know I'm going to be able to book another load and keep the truck rolling and not take, make the mistake of sitting two or three days waiting on one or deadheading out, which is going to eat up more of your your profits. Sam, are you, are you, hauling a drive -in? Of it. are you hauling a drive in or are you pulling reefer? Drive in. You're pull, okay. You're pulling a drive in. That'll just help me kind of conceptualize. Yeah. And when you're saying you're always setting up your next shot or thinking a couple moves ahead, do you do a lot of research on your own time to figure out what markets are hot, where you can go in a certain market, like what brokers may have relationships in different cities so that you have, you're more informed when you're trying to set up your next shot. Oh, all the time. All the time I'm over the load boards. So I'm trying to find out what market's hot because I mean, it's, it's changing daily. Okay. And is load board like the best place that you can go to figure out which markets are going to be hottest as opposed to, I don't know, other situations, whether it'd be like discussion boards with truckers or anything like that. If there's another one out there, I don't know about it, but I, I've utilized the load board. I use DAT mm -hmm. and it's, it's quick tools. I found out real quick what's going on just by, you know, a matter of minutes, I can just about see what all the markets across the nation are doing. Yeah. When I'm, when I'm training people, so I've got a whole section on training here. I, all of our kind of new hires that come in, we need to get them up to speed on the industry. And like the, one of the first things that I do on the second day is I interest, introduce them to DAT. I pull up the load board. I kind of show them how to read the different markets, what's going on in the industry. Because what a lot of people don't understand, and I assume that a lot of new drivers that come in don't understand that like one, the market is constantly changing. And like you said, it's not just about your outbound shipment, right? You're not just finding that load going to Denver for $3 a mile because you're going to have to get out of Denver once you complete that shipment. So like, that's one of the first things that I, I tell them is like, Hey, it's not just about like the market that you're going into. It's the market that you're going to have to come out of as well. We take all that into account when we're doing pricing. Is that something that a lot of new drivers understand? Or have you seen like, Hey guys, you need to understand that like, once you get to Denver, you have to get a shipment out of there. Like to me, that is just like common knowledge, but is that not the case with other drivers out there? I'm not real sure. I have, I mean, I can go with my own experience. I have talked to a lot of drivers that will take that $3 mile mm -hmm. Denver load just because there's a lot of money up front. So whether it's where the poker analogy comes in the next load, I don't know. Is this where the uh, poker analogy comes in with kind of gambling on what your next load might be? No, that's a little different scenario. <laughs> the poker, the poker scene. The, okay. I'm interested in this scenario. one. What's, what's your poker scenario here? Okay. You, you got to know when to hold them. You got to know when to bluff. You got to uh, know when to ante up. A little Kenny Rogers action. <laughs> well, 
it's like last year, 2018, you could go just about in any market and you didn't have to worry about another load. You could just roll in and ante up and not even give two thoughts about booking another load. And you would wait till anywhere from two to three to four o'clock that afternoon to book a load. That's when you, that's when you bluff and ante up because you know, the straight there, mm-hmm. you know, there's not a lot of trucks and you know, there's a lot more freight. So you wait till the last minute and you're going to get more freight per mile that way. Whereas this market, I will book ahead. I book like right now. I'm in. I'm in route to Wisconsin, and yesterday when I loaded up this load here, I booked another load in Wisconsin going down to Macon. You know, four days in advance. Mm-hmm. Now I still I put in a bid for it, and it's still about three hundred dollars over market rate average on the fifteen day average. But I still booked it four days in advance because when I get there, I don't want to take the chance of being left out. When you get to so Wisconsin, market, I'll book ahead. When I'll you- be in Wisconsin when Thursday night. Thursday night. So, so you went ahead and you booked that load going down to Georgia right after that. Are you going through brokers? Do you only work with brokers? Yes. As of right now, yeah. Is that because you just you like to be traveling all over the country and it's hard for you to always be in the same place at the same time or you prefer to work with brokers? What's your kind of reasoning behind that? I like the brokers for... The main reason is I like freedom. And a lot of my buddies has talked about getting directs. And one thing I, le- I learned about getting directs is depending on who, what company you approach, they want capacity, whether it's three trailers or 300 trailers. Mm-hmm. Now, that right there's one, one thing that holds you back. But the next thing that really holds me back from even thinking about directs is obligation. I like the freedom to choose when I want to work. So working with brokers gives me that freedom without having the obligation to haul five loads a week or whatever the, you know, whatever the contract is. You know, I, I had the obligation when I had that nine to five most of the years of my life. I don't want it now. That's that's the reason I, I'm strictly brokers. And do you have like favorite brokers when you're going and selecting the brokers that you work with? You say, all right, these are the five that I'm always calling. Or are you kind of scrounging the load board saying, hey, I'm willing to give this one a shot. I'm willing to give this one a shot. What's your opinion there? So far, I've gotten up my top brokers I work with. And that, I got them usually one through five. I go down the line. Are they the big boys, a nice mix of larger ones and then some smaller, more yes. local guys? Yes. You like to mix it up? Don't put all your eggs in one basket? Yeah. I'm set up with a couple of small, smaller guys, smaller brokers. A lot of the areas I end up in across the nation, they don't have accounts there. Mm-hmm. So that's when I got to rely on the, the other big boys. Mm-hmm. Do you have like a general loop that you'll try to drive? It sounds like you're in Georgia, you're in Texas from a couple of videos I've seen. Now you're in Nevada on your way to Wisconsin. Do you have 10 or 12 states you like to go between or are you just all across the 48? I chase the money, man. Where are your favorite (laughs) places to go then? I mean, I'm assuming if you've been doing this for all these years now, you've driven most of the major highways. What are your favorite lanes to take or like favorite routes to go to? That's hard to say. That's a very hard question. I just just done an article with a someone else and they ask the same question. The only thing I come up with is any of the scenic routes. Now I love the scenic routes. Most of the highways or not the highways, but the interstates, I've been there, seen it more than once. But when I get on a highway, a scenic route, it's like that's my first time. So yeah. just like I was back when I was twenty one, I'm glued to the windshield. I'm looking all over the place, taking pictures and stopping and you know, it's like a new a new adventure. Absolutely the scenic routes. Yeah. The beaten path. Sammy, there, there's one or thing. Off, off the beaten path, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, there, and there's one thing we've talked about too, and it's this, this old school idea of truck drivers being like the cowboys of the road and how it's kind of changing with government regulations and ELDs. Do you feel that at all or do you still feel as free as ever to kind of go out, run the business the way that you want, run the, the routes the way that you want? Do you still feel like it's kind of that romantic cowboy of the highway feeling? Oh, Absolutely. Man, one of my first videos, I said that. I said, you know, we're like the we're like the cowboys, you know. Instead of moving cattle from point A to point B, we're moving freight. Mm-hmm. And there is a lot of regulations that came up in the last twenty years, especially in the last five. But you know, I still have that freedom. And yeah. another five is probably going to be more regulations. But at the end of the day, it's still less regulations that you have in a factory job. Yeah, yeah. It it, it does have that romantic sense of freedom and. I, Jake's a big romantic guy. Right I am so. a big, I'm a big romantic guy. And you know, <laughs> I just, I've always been kind of a, a attracted to that lifestyle and I might have an opportunity kind of coming up here to go out and put my money where my mouth is. We'll see if I still like it when I'm actually out there. 
But when you're looking for spot freight, do you have like certain things about a load that you absolutely love? Like, hey, I love hauling this commodity. I love shippers like these. So that I'm going to go ahead and bid a little more aggressively so I can win this load. What really helps you identify like, hey, this is a load that I like to run outside of money. I know money talks, you know, but is there anything yeah. like an accessory to money that you say, okay, this is a load that I'll be comfortable with? Uh, yeah, there's a lot of plays into that. I've got a W900 uh, long wheelbase. Space is a big thing. And I'm always, I love the brokers that give you the address and you can see where you're going before you even place a bid on it. Mm. How many are That's doing number one. Is that? Is that commonplace now? I know of a couple, right? I know of a couple, but is it, is it five to six or is it like one, two, three of them do it? <laughs> I know of two. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like it was a dumb, dumb, dumb question. Yeah. So I know of two, I know of two for sure that do it. Okay. So that's the first thing. What else? Well, it's crazy. I've asked, I mean, it's still on subject one there. I've asked brokers. I said, what's the address? And they're like, well, I can't give you that information. And I'm like, dude, I got a big truck. If it's tight, I, don't, I can't go. And mm-hmm. they didn't want to give it. That's what's crazy. And I was like, are you afraid that I'm going to try to steal your accounts? Mm-hmm. Dude, I'm just one truck here. You know, <laughs> it's in the contract. I cannot steal your accounts. Um, I feel like it's two things. They, they still mm-hmm. don't want to do that. I feel like it's two things. It's either they don't want you to know who the shipper is before you book that load or they don't want you back soliciting. Like those are the two kind of mentalities yeah. of experiences. Like, okay, well, if we tell them it's going, picking up out of Blank. this facility, <laughs> they're not going to want to go there or they're going to quote me $500 more. So let's keep that quiet. Yeah. The deal has been done or it's the fear of back solicitation. I think in the end though, you're going to see a trend with more and more information coming to the forefront because if you have one or two brokers that start to provide information, carriers are going to love that. If it works and they don't lose a lot of customers over it, other people are going to have to, because if you don't know the shipper that you're going to, and you don't know the facility, just like you said, you're going to have to bid more because you don't know. If you don't know if it's a good shipper or a bad shipper, you're going to have to go somewhere in the between in your estimate. But if you are providing the correct information every time, you're putting the pressure on the brokers who are not providing that information and it's going to slowly kind of roll until truck drivers, in my opinion, will have like all of the information they could want at the end of the day. I think it's, I think realistically, Sammy, Mike, it's only going to go one way and it's going to be more transparent. Mm-hmm. I, I think you're right in assuming that the more transparent that one brokers get, other brokers or customers are going to have to follow. It's just kind of the nature, nature of the beast. I, I think in five years, we're looking at a totally different sort of industry altogether where the power I think is put back into driver's hands. And I don't think it's like this power struggle. I don't want to word it like that, but I think that brokers have had the luxury of kind of being selective about the information that they share. Yeah. When I started out, it was, you'd put major Metro and, or at least what I'd see when I'd go on to different load boards is there would be major Metro and major Metro, but that doesn't, I mean, major metros are pretty big. Like if you look at Los Angeles, it sprawls really across the board, especially if it's going, it was within Los Angeles. It's tough to just put major Metro to like Los Angeles to Los Angeles. That could mean a lot of different things, but if it's Los Angeles to Seattle or Dallas or anything like that, that's such a range of loads that you could be presenting to a carrier without telling them the weight, like the commodity type and all of those variables as we know are very important for a driver to decide what their rate's going to be. Yeah. And Sammy, that kind of leads me into my next question is how is, how has tech kind of impacted your ability to play the spot market and find the loads that you want to? I mean, it has to be vastly different from back in 2013 when you started driving to, to what it is now. Uh, what have you noticed about technology kind of coming into play and impacting your ability to go out and win the spot loads that you want? Honestly, I don't know how we used to do it. <laughs> I, I guess I'm spoiled to technology now. Uh-huh. It's just like, you know, before the call here, I opened up a fo- an app on the phone and said, all right, I need a place to park. I need to do a break. I need to do this phone conversation with these guys. And within 10 seconds, oh, there's me a place to park. Click what it over app? on satellite. I know exactly what I'm pulling into. What app is doing that? That's specific to truck stops? It's a uh, app. It's called Trucker's Path. And okay. it's got all the necessities that, we need as truckers, you know, where there's parking, showers, cat scales, shops, and it's just technology, technology base. Wow. Love that. Tr- you said it's trucker's path. Free shout out trucker to trucker path, yeah. trucker path, Sammy dropping the knowledge on trucker path. What are, what's one of like the gold mine loads that you've run, Sammy? Like you said, I can't believe that they're paying me this amount of money to haul this. Do you have like one that sticks out in your mind? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> My favorite broker's 
at the end of the day are the small guys, the people that that's not, you know, a big corporation. I was running uh, back in 2017 through that winter. I was running the account with them and the lowest paying load that I ran with them. And they was all short hops and overnights. Mm -hmm. The lowest one was 325 a mile. The highest was 405 a mile. And then the next, the second quarter came out in 2018. And there's another big key player came in and underbid and uh, took that same contract. And then they was trying to push that same load for like 900 a, a mile or uh, 900 a load whenever it was initially paying 13 to 1600. Mm -hmm. But, that's the biggest ones I've ran into so far is the small mom and pops that's got the big accounts and they're they're not trying to gouge so much meat off the bone. Yeah, see that that's an interesting thing about kind of the bigger brokers coming into play is like they're doing it at such a larger volume. Like one of the things that makes larger brokers successful is that they have the volume of trucks in their network yeah. to kind of they're always selecting the best truck, right? And they and they can always find the most competitive truck, but it makes it a lot more difficult. For, for different drivers out there. So it's like, I'm somebody that sympathizes with like both sides of that play. Like obviously I work for a fairly large 3PL and I get needing to price very, very competitively. And the more that we can price competitively, that means the more that we can find the most accurate driver for it, but it does kind of drive down rates on, on the driver's side. So it's like, I sympathize with, with, with both sides there. Yeah. You got to kind of sympathize with each side because, but, at the end of the day, as long as it's fair for both parties, right. hey, I'm, I'm good with it. Right. I, I agree too. And that's why I think the transparency is going to help so much come over the next five to 10 years. Just empower everybody. Like that's the term that I like to use. We need to empower everybody as much as possible in the industry yeah. to kind of make the best decisions to work with their business. So Sammy, what would you Very say well if you had advice based on things that took you a long time to learn when you were initially an owner operator? I know you drove for a long time, then you became an owner operator, then you got your authority. What were some things you learned at the beginning of each of those steps or that were hard for you to learn that you would recommend to new drivers or new owner operators? My biggest letdown was everything that I projected before I actually jumped into it. Everything that I put down on paper, the expectations, <laughs> it was way off. Like the so, expectations which, of revenue or? Yeah, because on paper, I've seen, I've talked to a lot of guys and I've told them the same thing because they say, you know, well, you know, on paper, I'm figuring out this, I'm going to be able to drive this many miles at the rates that average this and this. And I'm like, it don't work that way. It's in a perfect world. Yeah, it would. But you can't assume that you got to have the, good, the correct tools and know the rates. And mm -hmm. two, don't expect to do 700 miles a day. That's just not going to happen. What's realistic for you? Oh, uh, I'd say realistic. Well, coming out of Cali, I came out of Cali this morning. So realistically, 600 for me today because I had, what, two and a half hours of Cali, uh, 55 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. So that killed my longevity on high miles for the day. But if you're out of the metro, the highly populated metro areas, I'd say 600, 650 easy. Uh, highly populated metro areas, four to 500 miles. One of the things that I heard you kind of introduce uh, in one of your videos too was knowing your operating costs. Like that being like, and I've heard that before too. We've, we've had somebody on that's kind of talked about, hey, if you're going to go out and you're going to get your own authority and you're going to start hauling your own freight, you need to know what your break even cost per mile is. Is that something that you mapped out early on or did you kind of get into the industry, start driving and be like, oh crap, I should probably think about it in terms of this way as opposed to just what I need on that exact load? Well, I, I kind of done like everybody else. I jumped into it feet first and uh, then figured out I had to learn all these uh, these numbers. The first company, I, or the only company I was ever leased to, it was uh, contracted freight. It was fixed cost. And the only way I could make money is eliminate the expenses. So I, I dove into eliminating expenses on how much my fuel was, which is basically the only thing I had control over which that led me to crack down the math on every expense that I had. And that followed over when I formed my authority. But once I knew what my truck payment was going to be, my trailer payment, my insurance, when I got the truck driving, it, you know, fuel efficiently as possible, that's led me up to now. I know what my, my cost of operation is. And it's important because if you're, a lot of people has a cost of operation, let's just say a dollar fifty a mile and they accept the load from a broker at $1.40, forty, 
at that point, now they're paying that broker to haul that load. There's no money left over. Yeah. When people are talking about the rates per mile for what their operating cost is going to be, that has to like change between the type of driver though, correct? So you're over the road, you're taking longer hauls. So your break even cost per mile is going to be lower than someone who say would be local or, or someone who's like local or regional, not talking about like dollar per mile, but maybe dollar per hour or maybe like dollar per load because they're seeing how many loads it can fit into a day. Or how does that kind of vocabulary change as you get to different distances of drivers? Well, yeah, there's a lot of variables there. I'm going to assume if, if you're a local guy and you basically run 300 mile radius from home and you're home every night, you're not going to put in the miles, which the rates are going to be affected by that. The lower mileage from point A to point B is going to be a higher rate per mile. Now, I mean, that load might be three, four dollars a mile, whereas the guy that gets a load that's two thousand miles, he's going to be good to get a dollar sixty. So, yeah. I mean, there's so many different variables into that. Yeah, I mean, it's not only that, but it's also the commodity, the time it takes to load, because time it takes to load is going to affect a local driver a lot more than it will say an OTR, because a larger percentage of the time that they're um, using for that specific load. And so, you can see when you're mm-hmm. just getting into the industry, it'd be really difficult for I mean, there's just a lot to learn. And if you're going to drive local, regional, and long haul, it makes it even a steeper learning curve because you have to learn all three and then how you can use them together to make profit. Um, And I think that's why it's so beneficial for some people to have consistency, whether it's 10 different lanes, two different lanes, or just a bunch of years, because then you know what to expect with certain shippers, certain facilities, and you know how those entities are going to affect what dollar per mile or what dollar per hour you have to make to keep your doors open. Yeah. And, and that's all like, and the, the Sammy, I agree with here. That's, that's all good in theory, right? But like pr- practical application and the actual market is, is totally different. So everybody that I've heard is kind of saying, Hey, the market's really soft right now. Rates are kind of low right now. You hear all these carriers going out of business. What's your opinion? Are, are, are you seeing that it's actually soft and you've just gotten so good at playing the spot market that you're making just as much money? What is your opinion? Is it an actual soft market or are people just kind of not approaching the spot market the right way? I think it has to come down with expenses. And that's one thing I stress in all my teaching videos is you want the lowest monthly obligation possible. And a lot of people that went into the industry last year and bought the new equipment, the new trailers, because they just thought, you know, everything was going to be sustainable for the next couple of years. They went into high cost of operations for that truck and that trailer. I mean, I've, I know people to have $3,300 truck payments and 12 to $1,500 a month trailer payments. And when the market crashes, I won't say crashes, but when the when the market comes back down off its 2018 year high or mm-hmm. 2018 high, and it balances back down, then you're going to find it hard to pay for that equipment. I think the people that's going out is the people that was just they needed more profit profit per mile versus the guy that's got a low monthly obligation and he can make profit even if it drops down to a dollar. If any, that makes sense. I'm sorry. I'm no, it, it makes perfect, perfect sense. There. Here's, here's my follow-up question to that. Okay, so I want to go out and be an owner-operator. I want to get a truck. How do I keep my monthly obligation or my monthly payments or my monthly overhead down as low as possible, right? Like, what am I not doing or what do I have to do in order to keep that that overhead low? Is there something or does it, is it based on my credit? Is it based on a bunch of different factors? Like, how do I keep myself or my overhead as lean as possible? Well, credit's a huge benefactor there. Mm -hmm. Uh, With great credit, you're going to get cheaper insurance. With great credit, you're going to get cheaper interest. And another thing there is, I mean, a lot of people that I know is finance, commercial finance, and it starts out anywhere from 10 to 15%. And I'm in my equipment at under 6%. So my monthly payments is extremely low. Another thing is you don't ever go out and buy a new truck unless you've got enough capital put down or you have another truck to trade in to where even if you finance a new truck, you've still got a $1,500 a month truck payment. Mm. Because at the end of the month in a tight market or a very abundant market, $1,500 is a lot easier to come up with than 33 or 3,400. Same way with a trailer. A lot of people, they got to go out there and get that 60, 70, $80,000 reefer because they they like hauling reefer. Now Mm. they've got a $2,000 a month trailer payment 
and they go into it with no equity and they just right off the uh, start, they've got an insane four or $5,000 a month truck and trailer payment, which in a soft market, it's going to be hard to make. See, I think that's great information right there. Like I've never heard something like that. Like, Hey, one, buy a used truck, two, buy a used trailer, three, make sure that your, your credit is as great as possible so you can get the best possible financing. Like, I feel like that's information that people absolutely need to know. So I'm glad that we kind of got to that because I was always wondering like, all right, there's all these different operating costs and, and uh, what are all the variables that are included from insurance to truck payment to your trailer, all of that good stuff. So I'm glad that we kind of got that laid out. I, I feel like now I kind of have a better understanding of, hey, this is exactly how you keep your payments down low. Yeah, and now that you now that you have that good credit and you're able to reduce your operating cost, are you ever thinking about wanting to expand your operation to be more than the one man show, get other Ooh. trucks running under your authority? Ooh. Is that something that's ever crossed your mind? Yeah, but let me say something first on that. I'm I'm don't take me wrong, I'm not opposed to getting new equipment. I think new equipment is the best way to go. You got warranty and there's no wear and tear from the moment you get it. Versus you get a truck that's got a half a million miles on it, then every component on that truck is worn. But as a fresh guy starting out in the industry, I say go low. I say get a truck that's 80,000, get 400,000 miles on it, get a trailer that's three or four years old, and start that route. When you build up some equity in that and you pay that, those off and you've got a little money in the bank and you want to get new equipment, now you're going into the new equipment with money down or trade-ins. That's going to get you still back, even with new equipment, that still leaves you financing 80,000 on a new truck or 20,000 on a used tra or a new trailer because you're basically updating. But from the start, new equipment, no, that's not the route to go. Uh, start used and then work your way up to new. Now, what was that next one about? Oh, yeah. I was just wondering if you're ever thinking about expanding the operation to have some drivers that you're finding loads for or some just more people running under your authority. I'm wanting to expand into that. Uh, whenever I get to a point with my carrier where I can offer drivers more than just, you know, authority to run and book loads. I'm going to expand into uh, leasing guys on, but right now my biggest thing is I want to buy another truck and, and just basically start my own fleet mm -hmm. and just hire drivers. Love that. The, the American trucking dream, as I always say. All right. I got some questions for you. <laughs> yeah. Before we sign off here, because we are running low on time, there's a few things that we like to do. And then there's one special thing that I'm going to have you do for us. I'm going to ask you one question. And then I'm going to ask you to do one of your signature sign-offs that I've seen and heard so much about. So before we get into that sign-off, I do have one question for you. I've asked this to a few other drivers out there. What is your favorite truck stop throughout the country? Hmm. Now that's a tough one. Difficult question. Am I right? Yeah, it's a tough one. Let me think here. I ran into a Petro. I don't even, I've been it once. It's up in Minnesota. And they had a barbecue joint attached to the iron skillet Ooh. off the menu. I can't remember that one, but man, let me tell you, they had some great <laughs> barbecue. <laughs> and like the, truck, the whole the whole truck stop was like an old country store. Oh, I love it that! It was awesome. I love that. I feel like you have to take it. We might, we might have to research that one. Yeah, you got to take the food into account. You got to take the showers into account. Sammy, you know where I think my favorite truck stop would be? Anywhere that's close to Las Vegas, Nevada. I think that would be my go-to. Uh -huh truck stop. Not only, I'm sure they'd have great showers, but local proximity to gambling establishments, which is always a fun thing to do when you're out on the road, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, whatever you say. I'm going to I'm gonna have to start taking up some poker. I got, a, I got one of my best friends. He's a huge poker junkie. And just to hear him talk about it, I mean, <laughs> yeah. I'm going to take up poker. Yeah, no, I'm a blackjack guy myself. I never grew up playing, playing poker, but I'm kind of getting egged along to, to learn a little bit. And it's something to play with the boys, you know, have, have a nice Friday yeah. Saturday night with, with, with a friend's group. But now uh, I'm going to ask you, you do these fantastic sign offs and I'd like to have you do a sign off for this episode of Convoy Radio. Given your experience here, the fun that you've had, the knowledge that you've dropped, can you give us one of those famous Sammy send offs? I've got so many, but I will go with my favorite. You got to think high to rise and winners never quit and quitters. Well, they never win. Well, quitters, they never win. Sammy, thank you so much. This has been another episode of Convoy Radio. Michael, as always, it's a pleasure. Thanks, Sam. Thanks everyone for listening. I appreciate it. And until next time.
Thanks for listening to Convoy Radio. Remember to email us at podcast at convoy.com with questions, comments, truck tips, and stories from the road. Please subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes, Spotify, and Google Play. Convoy Radio is recorded at A-Train Studios in Seattle, Washington. Your hosts are Jake Henderson and Michael Lewis. Produced by Eric Ledbetter, Elise Van Buren, and Brett Howe. Content and support by Greer Lynch, Robert Kasner, and Connor Olson. Get free access to thousands of loads and book directly through the Convoy app. Download it today in the App Store or Google Play. Visit convoy.com for more information. Convoy.